Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to the ESIP webinar series on the socioeconomic value of earth science data information and applications. This is our sixth and final webinar of the series. Our webinar series has covered quite a bit of ground. The first part of the series focused on providing an overall context behind the meaning of socioeconomic value of earth science data. And these topics have ranged from value, change to value chains to assessment of value. The last two webinars that we had were focused on more specific case studies, which were provided by ESIP, the ESIP clusters of agriculture and climate and the disaster life cycle. And if you've missed any of these webinars, you can find them on the ESIP YouTube channel or, or the Fig Chair. Um, and to cap off the series, we highlight the role of education and communication in providing socioeconomic value from earth science data because these activities provide such a necessary bridge between science and decision making in our, in our society. So we're pleased to have the Clean Network leading this webinar on building societal capacity, the educational value of Earth system science, data, information, applications. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Frank Neopold from the Climate Program Office at NOAA. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity for uh, a, a very deep and rich team of people who've been working together for many, many years uh, and, and supported and part of the ESIP uh, community to share what we've learned and, and explore uh, other topics. So we, today we have Sean Fox from the Carleton College Science Education Resource Center, CERC. Um, we're going to be looking at the web architecture that, that, that we work within. Uh, Katie Boyd from our series, NOAA series, um, Cooperative Institute, um, looking at some of the, the impact and web analytics about our success. We also have Cheryl Manning, who's from the uh, formerly from uh, Evergreen High School and uh, now is at, at uh, NSF as an Einstein Fellow, uh, looking at the value of clean, and then we'll, get, we'll unpack that for you uh, for educators, and then also our uh, uh, ESIP fellow, uh, Clean ESIP fellow, uh, Patrick Chandler, who's also going to be joining us from his perspective. So uh, let's just jump right into it. I mean, it's a diverse group, um, and hopefully we'll have time for a facilitated conversation at the end. So next slide, please. So um, for those of you who don't know what Clean is, uh, Clean is originated uh, back in 2008 um, uh, to support the uh, recently released climate literacy framework. And so it's really about climate and energy awareness, um, but it is a community approach because we knew that a federal approach or a state approach or an NGO approach was, it really needed to be all of them. And so uh, CLEAN has, has really been around, stably funded across multiple grants and, and contracts since then. And, and a lot of partnerships we're gonna explore today are really important. Some of those are listed below, it's mm -hmm. actually bigger than that. Next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things we know and knew was that um, when you are teaching about climate, climate change, um, that the internet is not your friend. And so there's an example here of greenhouse effect middle school activity. This has been affirmed by practice with teachers all the time that they struggle to find accurate resources to help them that are efficiently and skillfully found very quickly. So if you hit the next slide, please. What we did was we reviewed the digital free landscape. Over 30,000 digital free educational resources that come from federal agencies, NGOs, uh, state organizations, um, you name it. Uh, but it all has to be as digital and free and we pre-reviewed and did a rigorous ro robust work of the internet and that's what the clean collection is. We built teaching uh, pages that support climate and energy. Um, called the Guidance for Teaching Climate and Energy, and then also created a, a clean network, which is the community of practice. And we currently have well over 660 participants in that network, um, and that's that's a to, that's all within the clean portal. So next slide. Um, so what you get at the end of that is when you look at the same thing, you get a very narrow, focused, highly reviewed, correlated. Uh, set of, of resources, but the thing that I think in, is important for ESIP is that the architecture that that allowed that that CERC and the work that for many grants that Sean is going to get into is what you're going to you might find more value not in the clean collection but the architecture and the process and the and the methodology 
of, of search and facet searching and, and indexing and, and curating um, that work that might be interesting for other projects in ESIP. Um, and there's a lot of practice there. You go to the next slide that the you know these guidance pages are very useful the architecture supports that they're cross indexed there's a lot of things that we can look at as far as the specifics but also the the process the next slide is and now this is the the, the network so this idea of building a practice a community a network around an important issue and all the tools that we've we've put together over the years um, and some of the ways that we work and collaborate and bring more people into the community and as people leave more people come in so it's been a growing community um, but very uh, open posture so that's just a quick introduction into the process I mean the kind of the point the why but I think you know moving into through the other presentation you know, we'll unpack that a little bit more so I want to be really precise with time so we can get into the real details so I believe Sean you're next um, yep, there you are. So uh, I give you Sean Fox from Cirque Carleton College. Thanks, Frank. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the web architecture at yeah, the next slide um, and how really answer three sorts of questions, cover three sorts of issues. First, the big one, what needs to happen for earth science data and tools um, to reach edu educators and to be useful to students? Um, I'll also talk a little bit about what the implications of that, the answer to that question are for web architecture. And I'm going to talk a little bit about clean as an example. So to unpack that first point a little, it's uh, sort of a longstanding best practice in science education to make sure that you not only have uh, the textbook full of information and the teacher at the front of the classroom, but also hands-on experience for the students in doing science and working with real science data. So if you walk into a chemistry classroom, there's going to be a lab where you're mixing stuff in test tubes and weighing them. If you work into a, walk into a biology classroom, there's going to you're going to be dissecting fetal pigs. If you walk into a physics classroom, you're going to be rolling uh, balls down inclined planes. Um, but there's sort of a longstanding challenge in the earth sciences in particular um, that it's harder to bring that sort of authentic science into the classroom beyond sort of hand samples of rocks. Um, and so there's this, been this image of earth science as the less data intensive science, at least as portrayed and taught um, across the country, when in fact we know um, practicing earth science is an uh, incredibly data intensive exercise in the first place. Um, so what are the implications of that for web architecture? Well, the, the advent of the web itself brought up this opportunity, which was um, if when the web appeared, um, scientists started putting their data up on the web for their own use to share amongst themselves, which they did, um, and web became ubiquitous in the classroom, um, students have access to web browsers, which they do, um, then in theory, um, bridging that gap, getting that data into classrooms for earth science classrooms um, is perhaps just a matter of getting students the right URLs. If they've got the right URLs, they can get to that science data and problem solved. Um, next slide. So it, of course, is not quite that simple. Um, so for many years now, folks have looked at this issue, how to get that science data that was now up on the web somewhere um, into effective use in the classroom. So this is one example of a group that tackled this issue. Um, this is a report that came out in 2008, was published in EOS um, by the Data Access Working Group, a uh, subgroup of what was then the Digital Library for Earth Systems Education. Um, and they came up with a bunch of recommendations for people who are building websites with science data in them who wanted that website to be of use to educators. And I'm not going to go into any of the details of what they, the sort of conclusions they drew, other than to point out that the, the full report's uh, available at the URL that's at the bottom of the slide, which you can um, download and get to, and I recommend. I will point out um, the first two bullets start with the words curriculum developers, which is interesting because, of course, when we talked about our simple model that would make the URLs available and then they get into classrooms and students would use them, um, curricular developers didn't figure into that picture. So that'll be, that's, that's something we're going to need to dig into a little bit more. Next slide, please. Um, another group that worked on this very same problem um, in 2013 um, the Earth Crew Project, which is an NSF-funded initiative, which to radically oversimplify is about harmonizing access to um, Earth-related science data sort of globally. Um, the Earth Crew Project convened a bunch of folks with expertise in using data, uh, Earth science data in education, um, and they generated a 12-page report um, with lots of good recommendations. And again, I'm not going to get into any of those details other than to say the URL is available here on the slide, and you can 
encourage you to go investigate it. I just pulled out some interesting excerpts to give you a sense of what sorts of things you might find in this report. Um, that first excerpt is basically saying if you want undergraduates to use your uh, science data, then building an undergraduate specific portal is probably not the way to go. Um, the second uh, point that I pulled out, um, this is observation that it's probably important to build interfaces if you're thinking about how to build tools, to build interfaces that combine um, historical and archive data with the outputs of models, the forecasts and predictions, and allow people to manipulate, uh, students to manipulate both those sorts of data together. So that's the sort of thing you'll find in this report. Next slide, please. So the take home, if you were to sit down and read both those reports, which I'd encourage you to do, um, at the very high 10,000 foot level, um, a few sort of take homes. First, um, doing this, bringing earth science data that's up there on the web into effective use in the classroom is non-trivial. Um, putting it up on the web in the first place is a necessary but not sufficient first step. Um, there's a big bridging activity that has to happen um, between the data being available and the data getting used. Um, one of the key elements of that bridging activity, um, there's usually somebody at the center, you might call them a curriculum developer, they might be a faculty member with um, a specific science background, but there's someone who can um, sort of cross that barrier between what's this science about and how does it actually fit into a useful activity in the classroom. That may be an individual or it may be a team um, who comes together with that expertise. And of course, at, to support this sort of bridging activity between the science data available, the science tools available in the classroom, um, there is going to be a, perhaps a multiple bridging steps and also um, the possibility that there are tools in web architecture that could support that bridging. Um, here's a few just examples. The first two are just things you might want to be explore on your own. I won't talk much more about them other than to say that UNAVCO is an organization that's very interested in disseminating the use of geodetic data. Um, and so they embarked on a project called GETSI, um, which is about doing this sort of bridging to get geodetic data more used in classrooms. And very similarly, GeoPrisms is the community of scientists who study the margins of plate boundaries. And they wanted that science to get into more use in the classroom. And that URL provides you access to a site where they've done that work. And now I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit specifically about CLEAN. Um, and what its role in bridging that gap between the science data and tools available and their use in the classroom. Next slide, please. So this diagram, Frank talked about the fact that Clean reviews um, large swaths of things from the internet and finds just the best. This diagram is a sort of a schematic of the review process. And I'm not going to go into any detail on this. And certainly, it's, you probably can't even read it on the slide, but that's fine. The takeaway of this diagram is that it's a complicated process. Um, to do a good job of reviewing these uh, activities and making sure we're getting just the best ones in front of teachers. So next slide, please. So to support this sort of very complicated review activity, um, we've built web architecture to support it. So this is a screenshot from the front page of an online review system that supports CLEAN. It tracks thousands of resources that have been identified all the way through all those steps in the process we saw in the previous diagram. Um, allows reviewers to enter their reviews, and at the end of the process, allows somebody to hit a button and make the thing that passed the review part of the clean collection. Next slide, please. Once things get into the clean collection, as Frank showed us earlier, um, we've now got a much smaller set of really high quality things that teachers can dig through, um, but it's still 700 items, and that's too much for a busy teacher to dig through every single one of them. Um, so we have to attend to in a fair amount of detail um, how do you provide an, a search interface that's very specific? Um, in this context is they're teachers, they want climate or energy activities, they probably got something in mind to fit in a particular class. Um, how do we give them the tools? In this case, it's a bunch of controlled vocabularies um, that sort of align well with the sorts of ways teachers are likely to be thinking about what they need for the, to, to work with, with their students. Um, and then a, a search interface underneath that. Next slide, please. Once teachers have jump through and found something that they think might be useful. Um, we provide an additional layer, um, which is we've had our reviewers who are experts in the science and the educational aspects of these sorts of activities, um, review them and gives them a fair amount of thought. And they end up writing up their recommendations and their observations in a set of teaching tips, which uh, notes from our reviewers um, includes teaching tips, uh, their reflections on the science, other things people teaching this activity or using this resource might need to know about the science, about the pedagogy, about the teaching method. Um, and this sort of information provides sort of an additional layer of bridging 
beyond what a curricular developer might have provided in pulling together the original resource. Um, but here's another perspective from someone else with appropriate expertise in the science and the education um, that can help the teacher both make a decision about whether this is a resource that's actually appropriate for them to use with their students and whether uh, and also provide some clarity, some points that the curriculum developer may have forgotten or not had the perspective to provide um, so they can make more effective use of it with their students. So that's just a little quick overview of some sort of major web, web elements in CLEAN that we've built um, that helps support its role in bridging part of this bridging process um, from starting from the curriculum developer who perhaps has worked with science data or tools, uh, pulling together into a, a resource that's usable in the classroom um, and sort of bridging that next step, which is actually getting into the hands of an educator, helping them discover it, feel confident that it's, the, that it's of high quality and that they know how to use it in their classroom. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Frank. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I, uh, there's so much more to talk about here, but we're, we're moving fast. Just to give you guys a, a total sense of it. Um, but Sean, that was awesome. And thank you for, for making the time. Uh, next is uh, Katie Boyd from the, uh, our NOAA's Cooperative Institute series, uh, talking about the, the efforts that were to measure the impact, because uh, we've been doing this since 2008. It's now, we're 10 years in, so uh, how are we doing? So Katie, to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so actually that was a great segue there from um, Sean's talk, because I'm going to be talking you exactly what Frank was just saying about how do we get this information out to teachers? How do we sort of communicate this? Um, and then how do we track whether that's successful or not? So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm just mostly going to here just overview the main tools we use for this are Google Web Analytics to help track on our website um, the activity and then more recently we've also been using um, the analytics that come from social media websites as well. Um, next slide. So what are our marketing efforts? What do we do? Um, one of the things we've been doing more recently, the top two are, are somewhat newer and um, the rest of them I'll get into are things we've been doing for a while, as Frank said, the last 10 years or so. Um, so one thing we've started doing the last couple of years is more social media engagement. So uh, trying to get um, our stuff out there <laughs> on the internet. Um, social media is a great way to do that. We've actually hired a student uh, to do this work for us and she uh, engages uh, with different organizations on social media. She um, posts uh, events, uh, markets, our resources, those kinds of things. Um, another thing that she's also been doing for us is um, developing this newsletter. So this goes out to an email list that we have of teachers. Um, we collect those from various uh, people can sign up on our website or um, at conferences we go to or anything like that. So we, do, we have a list, sort of an email list we've been uh, collecting for a while now. And in the last year or so, we've started um, doing these STEM flash newsletters. So that's where we try to take a current event or something that's currently happening in the media and then um, she did finds a couple of resources that might help you teach about that topic. Um, and so that's trying to just keep reminding people about these resources and to keep it current as much as possible. Um, we've been doing the rest of these efforts for a while now. Um, the webinars, we do about two per year. Uh, we offer a, a four series webinar about the, the collection, the, the guidance pages that Frank mentioned. So how do you teach about climate and energy? And then also how do you use this in your classrooms, how do you um, teach to your standards and develop units out of these resources and things like that. Um, and then as Frank sort of mentioned as well, we don't develop the resources, um, but we do work with the developers uh, who actually make these resources as much as we can to try to bring people back to clean. So in our collection, um, when you go to a resource, it talks about the resource, but then you have to click on a link to actually go out to somebody else's website for that resource. Um, so we've been working to try to then also bring people back through those websites. Um, a couple of ways we do this. One is uh, the, the clean widgets become a little bit of an older technology, um, but we do still have that on some websites where we've asked the developers to put our widget on their website to sort of direct people back to clean. Um, resources, especially websites that don't um, uh, have as many resources. We use this selected by logo. So similar to the widget, we 
um, ask these developers to put this um, selected by logo that's on the right of this slide um, onto their website. And that sort of, again, tries to direct them back to clean to say, this is a resource that was that is part of this collection. Um, we've also been working more recently on trying to get syndication with large education sites. So like um, we've done this with uh, the National Science Teachers Association, and then we're working on it with PBS Learning Media. So these larger um, educational sites uh, could can syndicate and actually house our collection on their site. So um, those are some of the stuff we've been doing online. Uh, we also do other work outside of um, the internet. So pres presentations at conferences, we try to go to regional conference, teacher conferences, um, as well as larger national conferences. Um, specifically, we do target education conferences, but we also present about clean at uh, geoscience conferences in their education sections and things like that. Uh, we've also done some targeted outreach, so that's where we try to um, contact uh, at leaders in, in local areas. Um, specifically, we've targeted state level, try, trying to find the state supervisor, state science supervisors in each state for education and giving them sort of kits and ways to uh, talk about clean to their teachers. So trying to um, get at that uh, gatekeeper idea of finding the people that teachers actually will listen to. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So how do we track these efforts? Um, as I mentioned before, the biggest way we track it is with Google Analytics. So this allows us to look at the clean website um, and track sort of who's coming, how long they're staying, what they're looking at. Um, through social media, we can track many things around um, who's following us, um, who's reposting anything, and then this other idea that Twitter and Facebook actually have is um, impressions. So that's going beyond just who's directly interacting with you and who um, they, they get a sense of sort of how many people might have even seen this post you've put up there, even if they didn't directly like it or repost it. Um, so we do these things, as I mentioned, just to, to track generally how popular um, our site is, but also to track some of these um, marketing uh, um, efforts we're doing. So one of those is um, looking at how popular each page is and trying to market the more popular pages out there. So it ties back in, we get a sense of what's working, but then we can also try to see what's popular and try to market that as well. So it's sort of this cycle of marketing, trying to figure out <laughs> what's working and then how to use that data as well. Um, the other big thing that we do, um, oh, sorry. So for the page views, um, I was just going to mention that's something we've been working on, actually trying to develop a new webinar to um, for professional development, because we've noticed some of our teaching guidance pages that Frank mentioned are really quite popular, actually, and people um, come back to sort of the same topic um, quite a bit. So it'd be really great to try to, you know, um, hone in on that and uh, see if we can increase our reach even more by trying to sort of focus on that. We also look at um, how people come to our website. This is really important for our marketing efforts. Um, for example, we look at whether people, a lot of people find our website through searches, like a Google search or what have you. Um, but we can also see if people do a direct link that helps us track whether they've come from like a presentation that they might have heard about the link. Or um, this summer, for example, we sent out a bookmark in a uh, kit of resources that went out to teachers across the country and so uh, we were able to see the sort of direct link spike referral there which we thought was somewhat connected to that. Um, we also look at whether our social media campaigns are um, success successful uh, based on whether people you know get referred to us from the social media and we can see what sites are um, popular in terms of people coming from there? How are they finding us through climate.gov? Is it through the PBS Learning um, or these other sites? Another one we had this summer was we had actually a news, um, an NBC News article written about our efforts and that had a huge spike of people getting referred from that. So that was kind of neat to see and track. Um, we also look at where people are coming from is another big one we track in our Google Analytics. Um, this allows us to look at, as I mentioned, these presentations we do and whether there are spikes that come from that local area after that. And we can also, um, and I think Cheryl after me is going to talk a little bit more about the national standards, which are called the Next Generation Science Standards, these NGSS. Um, 
acronym that's here, uh, that there's about 30 states that have actually adopted those. And so we can look at um, where teachers are looking at our resources and whether they, we know whether they have NGSS in their state. And so we can again target specifically to these states because our um, resources are aligned with those national standards. Um, the last thing we've been doing more recently, and we, uh, we did it over the summer and we're hoping to do it again, is a pop-up survey. So when people come to our website, we get, if they're there for 30 seconds or more, they this survey pops up and it's fast, it's five questions, um, pretty easy to do. And not everybody does it, obviously, you get pop-ups online, you don't wanna do that, but we ha did get a decent, um, a response from our last survey and we're hoping to do it again and that's where we can dive in a little more beyond the numbers and get a sense of sort of how people found out about clean what they find valuable about it um, those are the main questions I think we ask other than sort of who you are if you're an educator or not so go to my next slide please and I just wanted to really quickly give a sense of um, the numbers for this, that our marketing efforts have been successful, and we can see that in these Google Analytics, which is really neat. Um, so over the last year or so, our users and page views increased by about 70% um, over the, the previous year. And then similar with our number of sessions, um, those increased by like 45%, I think is what I calculated for these numbers. So we really are seeing that, um, especially some of the newer efforts that we've been doing, trying to get this information out to teachers over the last year or two have been successful. And it's um, really been useful for us, as I said, as we try to, uh, think about how do we reach teachers, how do we communicate this out to them, and then how do we use data to, to measure that. Um, this has been really, I think, valuable for us to try to become even more successful and reach more people through, um, through CLEAN. And with that, I'll give it back to Frank. Thank you very much, Katie. So uh, moving through, uh, uh, Cheryl Manning from, uh, uh, she's a science teacher and a science education consultant. Uh, um, and uh, she worked with us on uh, a lot of different parts of CLEAN. So having her uh, master teacher perspective here is awesome. So Cheryl, you're next. Well, thanks. Thanks, Frank. Um, uh, today I'm going to be presenting on uh, how using CLEAN's data focused resources uh, in the classroom can fulfill many of the different um, needs of teachers and needs of students as we uh, sort of progress through our evolution with data in the classroom. Next slide. So the clean data, clean uh, data sets uh, support good instruction in many different ways. Uh, real data is so important to teachers because when students interact with that, they have the opportunity to develop skills that they may not otherwise. Uh, in particular, uh, using spreadsheets, uh, spreadsheet programs, students get to organize and manipulate and analyze data. And if the da data is geolocated, in other words, if it's tied to a place, students can gain a quantitative sense of space and what's happening there in lots of different ways, whether it's weather or topography or different sorts of um, earth phenomenon. Students also learn basic skills and modeling and how data can be used in making decisions or maybe should be used in making decisions. Um, Earth science data is used in AP computer science, but it's also used in AP environmental science, AP chemistry, and AP uh, physics. I went back and looked at some old exams and saw a few examples of Earth science data being used in all of those. And so what we need to know is that, that when that data is available, it helps prepare students for these more rigorous courses. Earth science data is relevant, it's interesting, and it challenges students' thinking in many different ways. It's relevant because it, it connects to places and events that students might be learning about or are interested in. It's interesting because it can answer so many of students' questions about why something is happening or how it's happening. And it challenges students because earth science data can be messy and complex. It emphasizes space and time, and it helps students learn the difference between causation and correlation um, with the right guidance. The clean collection of resources contain many different opportunities to work with data, um, and I'm going to walk through that next. Um, and in that, we'll be looking at how skill development and content understanding can happen by using this information. Next slide. 
All right, so a framework for K-12 science education was published in 2012 by the National Academies and provided the foundation for the next generation science standards. These two documents elevate the science and engineering practices, which students engage in, should be engaging in regularly. And these skills should be developed and progress progressively from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, here is a progression for how students might be working with data. In kindergarten through second grade, uh, we expect students to um, make simple pictures with data that help them make some comparisons and start to find patterns. In grades three through five, students begin to make data tables and graphical displays and discover relationships. Grades six through eight, um, we're building that sophistication by um, looking at graphical displays of data, identifying relationships that are mathematical, um, maybe looking at temporal and spatial data, and cause and effect versus correlation. So that's the first time that starts taking, um, make it, kind of entering the picture in students' thinking. The Next Generation Science Standards also um, expects students in the middle grades to start identifying the limitations of data sets and apply simple statistics and make interpretations. By grade nine through 12, grades nine through 12, students should be using technology. So spreadsheet programs, uh, whether it's Google Spreadsheets or Excel or something like that, but they should be using those and getting very comfortable with those to manage data, um, do some sorts of statistical analysis, evaluate and interpret data sets, and use their data to support claims and evaluate models and characterize systems. And so the little pictures I have here show some of the things that, um, these are just screen captures from different sorts of activities from elementary through middle to high school. And those, um, those graphs are becoming more and more complex along the way. All right, next slide. All right, so when you're using Clean uh, right now, uh, if you were to do a Google search on something, um, it would pull up something on the order of a million plus resources um, in terms of climate data or anything having to do with climate change, climate data, teaching about climate with data, uh, you're gonna get over a million hits. Clean narrows that down to something around 700, and these have been vetted and uh, reviewed by both scientists and educators. And so you can trust that these things have strong pedagogy and good science combined. 727 matches is a lot to think about. So you can refine these results uh, when you're looking for the data heavy um, resources by looking at the next generation science and engineering uh, practices. There you can see there's 20, 248 matches for middle school and 346 matches for high school. Uh, if you were to click on um, those matches, you could narrow this down a little bit more by uh, selecting the analyzing and interpreting data or the using mathematical and computational thinking. Another way to refine the results is um, the data set usage, and you can see there that it's 137 matches. So all of these are different ways to narrow the search down, and, and if you know what it is you want to teach about, uh, that's helpful. You can put that up in that little search bar at the top. All right, next slide. So one example that I um, pulled from the Clean Collection is uh, this Paleo Tempestology Lab. This was developed by Kira Lawrence at Lafayette College. Um, students are engaged in understanding how the history of hurricanes have changed, uh, or how the frequency and intensity of hurricanes has changed through through um, some sort of stratigraphic record. So the stratigraphy is the, the record of, of sedimentation in an area and students look at the characteristics of that sediment and do some radiometric dating of materials. They don't they don't do that, but they have data around that stratigraphic record and the, the radiometric dating. And from that, they can um, start to assess how often have hurricanes occurred in a particular location and to what degree have they um, disrupted the sedimentary record. So this provides students with both spatial and temporal data, and it gets them interacting with um, data in a spreadsheet. So there's multiple tabs of data. So there's formula and macros that go between those, those tabs. Students create graphical displays, conduct some statistical analyses, and then make some predictions through, um, through their interpretations. So this is just one example. and um, 
this is a this particular resource I've used uh, with ninth graders, and uh, it works very well. All right, next next slide. Um, many of the other data rich resources in the Clean Collection, um, uh, when when you go in and you start looking, you start to see some themes. Uh, there are many resources that use the GeoMap app. So these are geolocated data resources um, that really allow for a lot of exploration and so students can the geomap app is a wonderful tool uh, da database tool that that students can use and then the earth Ex exploration toolbook is also um, rich with data and there's lots and lots of different lessons and units in that particular um, a resource uh, highlighted in the clean collection and then finally using some live data sets this is really really a great way to in engage students in things that are happening right now. So the thing uh, that, that occurred to me is, how does caladap.org uh, data look at some of the fire information that has, um, that's been collected there in the last few months? Uh, you can also look at the, the drought monitor, uh, our US drought, uh, the drought.gov website, and then finally, some of the global data provided um, at, on the noaa.gov site. So these are some of the data rich resources that are repeated over and over and again in the clean collection. All right, next slide. Next, there we go. Um, all right, so to top off, top off my little presentation here, some of the things that teachers um, need in a data set, uh, context is helpful to know the story behind the data. Uh, that really helps to engage students in the process of, of the analysis. Um, provide some essential findings so that teachers can guide their students in the right direction. And these can be buried in a teacher page um, uh, that can be protected from student view if that's an appropriate thing to do. Um, don't feel the need to overly process the data, but do make it manageable to read. Um, and there's a difference there because we want data that's, that's messy and it challenges students. We just don't want it to be so messy that it overwhelms them. And then providing a lot of different types of data for students to investigate freely. Um, that gives them a chance to maybe work on things that are associated with uh, science fair projects or uh, open inquiry um, investigations. And so those types of data sets are, are very valuable to teachers. I hope this was helpful. And I'm going to give turn it back over to Frank now. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. There, this is this is. Uh, I'm gonna have to discipline myself because I, I want to ask tons of questions already. So, um, but uh, we're gonna keep on going. Uh, last person in our, our set, and then we're gonna open up to questions and kind of explore these things together uh, with the other members from the ESIP community. Is uh, Pat Patrick Chandler? Our he's our ESIP uh, fellow, uh, that's supporting the Clean Cluster, and uh, his perspectives. He has uh, recently. Uh, recommitted to a second year of, of fellowship, and we are incredibly honored and, and excited to have him uh, supporting us in the education community yet again. Patrick, to you. Thank you, Frank. Much appreciated. Uh, next slide, please. So here are your six 2018 community fellows. I'm in the upper middle picture there, and to my left is Matt from the University of Michigan. The upper right is Katie from Yale. Lower left is Jessica from UCLA. In the middle is Connor from the University of Nevada. And in the lower right is Ronalda from the University of Montana. I hope that uh, all of you have had the opportunity to meet this great group of folks. It's a really diverse group of fellows um, working on a number of different issues. And um, most of us, are on our way out there in this group. Um, Connor in the lower middle and myself in the upper middle are sticking around for another year. So we hope to connect with you in 2019, but there's a total of 10 2019 ESIP community fellows. So there'll be quite a few of us. This program has been incredibly valuable for me. And I, from what I've heard from the rest of the fellows uh, to all of us, because it's provided us two communities, uh, one in the ESIP community in general, taking a look at uh, a really wonderful group of scientists who are 
doing their best to really make data meaningful. And also each of us have our own community uh, with where we're situated in our fellowship. This year I've been working with the education committee and the clean network. And next year I'll be focused primarily uh, with clean. And I, I came back because I really saw the potential of connecting the clean network um, with the rest of, of ESIP with a, a little more networking and broadening those ties. I'm really excited to be able to do that. Next slide, please. Before I jump into what those connections might look like and what they mean to me, I wanted to take a short step back and uh, give you a little bit of my own story on how I ended up in this position and um, really what, what creating meaningful engagement tools has meant to me and how I think we can do that with ESA Clean Partnerships. So my background is as an environmental educator and um, I worked in the education community for about 10 years and ended up in Alaska where I was the International Coastal Cleanup Coordinator for the state. In that role, I helped run community cleanups and um, helped facilitate remote cleanups and also took in all the data I could gather for the state to report to the Ocean Conservancy who helped run that program. And what I found year after year is I would gather this immense amount of data and report it and use it to present at conferences and town hall meetings and to school groups so that I could justify funding more cleanups to gather more data to do the same thing year after year. And I started to realize that the groups we were reaching were the same groups that we'd reached the years before. It was a, a single committed community that really wanted to engage this issue. And I think that's pretty common in the, the data world. A lot of the times the people we present our data and research to are the same year after year. But especially when it comes to environmental issues, I think it's incredibly important to reach outside the box. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to, to find a way to do that. And I chose to um, integrate arts into my communication and started to work with Angela Hazeltine Potsy, who's the founder and executive director of the Washer Shore Project in Southern Oregon. And she came up to Alaska. We made a set of sculptures that I toured the state with there. And then I went down to become their education director where I built a curriculum um, in partnership with NOAA and um, taught the educators and staff of museums and aquariums and uh, galleries where the exhibit traveled to how to teach about this issue using the arts. I think that uh, the clean community can do something really wonderful for much of the ESIP community and help them consider how to reach outside the box that they may be tucked in in communicating their data and research. Uh, next slide, please. And I found uh, some of that potential myself. Last summer, I won a Funding Friday project to create a sonification of the NOAA greenhouse gas index. Um, I wanted to create an audible rather than a visual experience to expand the data set to reach visually impaired uh, learners and also to provide a richer data experience to combine with the visual resources available. Uh, next slide, please. So I look forward to presenting this particular example of data communication to you in January in the winter meeting. Um, pretty far along on it, I've been using Max MSP and teaching myself that software to create a, a system that um, hopefully will communicate both radiative forcing and amount of these gases in the atmosphere. And I think there are, are so many different amazing data sets and projects going on in ESIP. Each one of the groups probably has a number of them. And if we can connect and say, okay, you, you've got this amazing information, how do we bring it to, uh, to the community that really needs to hear it? 
how do we give it to educators so that they can bring it to classrooms? Um, I think the CLEAN network can really help with that task. Next slide, please. There are a number of ways that CLEAN can do that. We have an amazing community, and I think that if you have a project that you're interested in communicating, we can help find you the right people to transform it into a form that will reach the audience you're hoping to reach. In addition to helping with those connections, you can also present your research directly at our weekly teleconferences. Next slide, please. If you're interested in doing that, those conferences are every week, uh, Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, and you can reach out to myself or Katie Boyd, who's on the call, and we'll help give you the details of what those presentations look like and what you would need to be a presenter. Next slide, please. But I just want to reiterate that whether you choose to present or just reach out to the Clean Network so that we can connect you to those who can help you find innovative methods to communicate your research, uh, the Clean Network is a valuable resource for the rest of ESIP. And um, I look forward to acting as a liaison in the next year to really expand those partnerships and the potential of what this amazing data community can bring to this amazing educational community. And I look forward to talking with you more about that in the winter meeting. Thank you. Hand it back to Frank here. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, just to, if you can go to the next slide, just want to highlight a few of our upcoming priorities, and um, I think that the the because we're coming close to the end, and I want to open up the the time. But as you look at these, um, why don't we, uh, if we have questions, um, you know, because one of the ones, the second bullet there, supporting and growing the clean collection in the network, um, that's an area where ESIP uh, can ap actively easily interact with uh, this part of the uh, the cluster. But because, um, you know, one thing that Sean highlighted is that every resource that is passed has an expert science review. And that expert science review, uh, and there've been hundreds of scientists who've lent their time pro bono uh, to do that final review because they're independent of the developer. So that's just one action uh, pathway, but there's others. So uh, let's it open up to questions and just go to the next, uh, uh, point and we have about we have about uh, 11 minutes for open questions. Thank you very much, Rika. So um, questions. The floor is open. Uh, we can go in any direction that is valuable for whoever wants to go. I've got a couple questions if, if no one has any. You can either type them in uh, in case there's a, a, a audio challenge. So um, I, how about this? I, I, I'll go I'll go with one and, and just you know interrupt us as, as we need. Uh, given um, what we've heard so far, uh, I'm thinking about this for the for the people who are listening to the recording. Anybody who presented, or Rika, if you have a question, is there is there something that you think we would delve in more to as as, as ESIP uh, continues to grow and evolve that would be valuable for us to to uh, comment on? Or is there a direction or anybody who was there that saw something that we needed to reinforce from what anybody else said? Yeah, I actually wanted to kind of add. I, I think um, I think Cheryl um, did a really great job of kind of highlighting this. How do educators use data, right? And our resources sort of provide. A, there's a, a lot of our resources that do provide actual scientific data. That's one of the we, things you can search for in the collection. You can uh, search for the tag that shows um, resources that specifically utilize data. And I, I think that that's just, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to highlight that I think that's, for me, I don't, I don't know the 
ease of community as well as others here probably do. But I thought that was a really important point to kind of stress here is that idea that um, you can utilize clean to sort of, as Sean was saying, be that bridge between um, people who make and collect the earth science sort of data and the teachers who might want to use it in their classrooms and um, that that's sort of, you know, CLEAN provides the mechanisms for trying to reach those and communicate with those teachers. Um, so anyways, I, sorry, thanks for giving me that opportunity. I just kind of wanted to throw that in there as a highlight. Thanks, Frank. Sure. Any other points that, that uh, others want to make? Yeah, I'll just well, jump in here. This is Arika. Sorry, um, this is Arika, and, and, and thank you all for such a great presentation. Um, and I really liked how this this whole presentation um, demonstrates some of the diversity. I think that's necessary for communicating and communicating earth science data. Um, I think just knowing the the ESIP community, I, I feel like maybe we 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 don't think we we don't have the opportunity to think or, or really about how this data can be found and applied across such a diverse members of the society, particularly, I think, just, you know, K through 12, just speaking to Cheryl's presentation. For me, that was really interesting to think about that, um, especially how maybe children, you know, how that education begins from from children. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, the way we think about earth science data or scientists in general is that we just think at it from a very high level, but um, there's just lots of different ways that this information can be um, applied. Um, and also thinking about how, you know, the information that we are creating now can be used in future generations and just building upon these lessons learned. Um, so I really enjoyed the diversity that was, was in these presentations and, and um, thinking also about how the clean network can be that collaboration between the ESIP community, because I think that most of the ESIP projects are, there's usually an aspect of, um, you know, how do we make this tool or this information broadly accessible and broadly used and, um, but you know, I think most projects can't do everything. So a collaboration like this that has experts in education, experts in communication, I think is what um, ESA projects could really use. So I hope to see some of these collaborations um, start coming together. Thanks. So, so one other thing that I, I want to reinforce is that that it took the diverse set of people kind of moving towards a, a, an objective um, with purpose for for a decade to really start seeing the the focus and the results that that Katie highlighted, and I think that a lot of times we try and get results and impact too fast, and um, and then you know it didn't work, and so we kind of throw up our hands and well I guess that didn't work, but uh, that's not the case. But uh, uh, there's there's a couple of th across the themes that of all these talks, the kind of that always were refining and improving and sustaining. And it took a, a variety of funding mechanisms and a diverse community of practice across a sustained period of time in order to get impact. And I think that's a really important point um, for other like initiatives on different topics other than climate and energy. Um, but uh, you know, that that requires, you know, there's been a lot of stakeholder engagement to make sure that they appreciate the when you can have impact. Um, so, you know, that was, that was very important for us to sustain the initiative. And now we're really starting to see the impacts and the positive outcomes just now uh, in the last 14 months. So I don't know if that spurs anything else for others. Yeah, this is Cheryl. And I, I, I just want to say that it's been a, a true honor to have the chance to work with the Clean Network. Um, and I think that there is an immense amount that we can learn from the process. Um, one of the things that I do um, think that I, I'm really glad to see that that ESIP has an, you know, is is looking at at projects like Clean to reach teachers. Um, this working with data has been something that, as a as a teacher for over 20 years now, I've been pretty passionate about. Um, and as the next generation science standards come on board. Um, more and more students are going to be coming into the college arena with a different perspective of data and how to use data. And I really encourage um, faculty members and people who are developing curriculum to not lower the bar. Keep that bar high. Keep it attainable. Scaffold it. But you know, don't lower that bar. Keep 
keep challenging students and challenging teachers and instructors at the college level to to engage their students with data so that we develop a culture and a society that understands what data is and how it works and how we can use it to combat um, misleading information. Thank you. Very important point, Cheryl. Any in our in our final four minutes, any other uh, points or questions now that we've you know that are open to others? We can keep on going all day. <laughs> we that's what we do. Is Frank is is Clean Network going to be present at the ESA Winter Meeting in January? So the uh, I am planning to go uh, as the I'm a co-chair of the network. Uh, and one of the things I'm looking forward to is how do we interface and build more shared practice. Um, that's uh, definitely something. But also, I think the the wider membership uh, need to learn and you know hear from us and us to hear from them. So that that is my intent. Where is that meeting? Oh, it's in. Oh, I might be able to go. That would be great, Cheryl. I think you would um, do a great deal. Yeah. Out. I, I'd have to let me look at my calendar and see, but uh, that might be something that I can that I can swing. And I know Patrick is, is going as well. Yeah, and so I'll just skip down to here so that um, you can see that um, the the winter meetings in Bethesda. It's from January fifteenth to seventeenth, and um, it's it's. Um, it's there every year, so the winter meeting is always there in Bethesda. And I think one way that, um, like sometimes I see education sessions at the, the ESIP meeting and I don't personally go to them, but one way to attract ESIP people perhaps is to think about um, how some, some of the things that I think Patrick was saying is a good way to reach people. Um, thinking about education as being a, a, a value added aspect to projects, because I think, as I said, most ESIP projects are looking for you know, for adding that aspect to their projects, but they just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So um, I think sh demonstrating that CLEAN can offer that type of support um, will might be able to help with that. And um, it would be great, Cheryl, if you can go, because uh, I think having end users like, you know, educators and teachers and having that perspective there is just, is so important. And I would personally love to see more um, teachers just um, demonstrating there their um, their perspectives at ESIP meetings um, because as you said I think the generations are changing in terms of how they understand and manage and use data or science data in particular um, and and I, scientists you know need to be aware of and and data managers need to be aware of of how how that landscape is changing. So, so one other important point on that is that I think that some of the efficiencies about the way that our communities worked. Um, kind of give you a leg up on these projects that that you know you don't have to do it the um, starting from scratch and we we totally didn't do that in this project um, so there's a lot of deep work that we benefited from uh, Sean showed a lot of that that we would never have gotten the success we got um, without starting from a very deep bench of, of capability so that's uh, that's kind of what we bring to the table I know it's a it's a 128 Arika that that does that mean that we are we are good um if others want to ask us questions uh email is also a viable way to, to engage us yeah great thank you yes yeah, so i just want to thank all the presenters um for for this webinar and particularly to the clean network for leading the webinar um and i'm just gonna there's some there's a slide here with some links um this these links will be active on the fig share that um, I'm going to upload the presentation there, so I won't upload the links here on the chat. Um, Arika, so, I'm, Arika, I'm not seeing a change in the slides. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Wrong slide. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so here are the, um, to join the, the CLEAN network, as was noted in the other slides from Patrick, that um, this is the, you can join the CLEAN network email list. They are open to any outside participants. Um, the meeting telecons are here's are listed on the ESIP calendar. Um, you can contact Katie or Patrick, and then some of the previous meeting notes. You can take a look at those. Um, for ESIP, there's ways to stay involved through the Monday update, through the joining the collaboration areas of which Clean is one of them. Um, and then the ESIP winter meeting um, is in Bethesda. The registration is currently open, um, so we 
like hope that you can you can make it. And then our partners in this webinar series is the GeoValue community, and they are also an open community, and you can join that as well. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank everybody for participating and for maybe listening to this this webinar um, from the YouTube ESIP YouTube channel. And if you have any other questions, this is a, this is our last webinar of this series. So if you have any questions about this webinar or the series, you can contact me, Arika Virponsi, here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.